Hi there, my name is Kirsty Trail and today I'm going to be presenting on a number of topics from defining your customer experience to understanding your customers. I'll cover the importance of personas, crafting your voice of customer program and how to set up and manage customer support via social media. I've designed this session to provide you with practical takeaways that are easy for you to be able to operationalize in your business. You'll come away with tips and best practices that are simple to understand and implement. So let's get started. So first, a little bit about who I am. I originally grew up in New Zealand and worked for Hewlett Packard New Zealand in a variety of sales and marketing roles, culminating running the supplies business, HP's profit center, before I decided to head overseas. I then spent three years living and working in Tokyo, Japan with HP, and you might be wondering why and how that's important or relevant. Tokyo is really where I fine-tune my learning around the importance of customer focus and persona definition. Because in Japan, HP has only 10% market share versus giants such as Canon, Epson, Hitachi, and Fujitsu. And part of my job was figuring out why this crazy 10% of Japanese clients or customers were not patriotically loyal to their local brands like the rest of the population and then devising marketing campaigns to target other Japanese customers exactly like them. Following my stint in Japan, I spent the next 13 years of my life living and working in Silicon Valley. I moved there with HP to run a part of their $1 billion online store and then joined Snapfish, a $100 million e-commerce company, where I was the head of business development and strategic partnerships, followed by the general manager of Canada, and then the chief customer officer. More recently, I've been the VP of customer at Hootsuite, responsible for customer support, insights, feedback, customer experience, customer marketing, and the post-sale customer journey. Following Hootsuite, I joined Yex as a search experience platform in September of 2019 as the VP of Client Advocacy. Yext are a New York Stock Exchange traded company with a $2 billion market cap focused on putting businesses in control of their facts online with brand verified answers in search, regardless of where or how customers are searching. In September of last year, I joined Movac, New Zealand's preeminent venture capital firm, as an operating partner, where I work with the Movac portfolio of companies to ensure that they grow and scale their business operations globally. So today we are going to cover a variety of topics. We'll start with customer experience, then transition to personas, we'll talk through the voice of customer, and I'll also cover social customer support. But first I wanted to start with a quote from this guy who hopefully most people know who really grounds what we're here to talk about and our focus on the customer and why it's important. Many people erroneously believe that Apple is a technology company first and foremost. And what I love about this quote is you hear arguably the, queen, the king of customer experience himself talking about the fact that you've actually got to start with the customer experience and then work backwards towards the technology. So really, it starts with deeply understanding what your customer needs and then working backwards to, divine, to devise services and solutions, more importantly, to serve that need. So what is the customer experience and why is it important? Customer experience means ensuring that your customers have a seamless series of interactions across all of the various touch points in their journey with your company. It is hard to deliver good customer experience without understanding your customers, who they are, how they think and feel, what they want in their interactions with your company, and the problems they came to your solution to solve. The goal is then to deliver the right messaging, the right content, and the value that the customer needs at that specific moment in time with as little friction as possible. And customer experience is a competitive advantage. In this 2019 report by Gartner, their customer experience management survey, they said that today, 59% of companies expect to almost completely or completely compete on the basis of customer experience. So this was in 2019. And then two years from now, which lands us right into 2021, 
80% of companies expect to almost completely or completely compete on the basis of the customer experience. So clearly a lot of companies have aspirations to turn their customer experience into a competitive advantage. And at the same time, execution is absolutely critical. Again, a study by Gartner around customer experience in 2017 has 81% of companies saying that their company will mostly com or completely compete on the basis of customer experience in two years. So clearly the data across a couple of different companies is aligned. Yet at the same time, when you go through and look at the external impact, only 22% of customer experience if efforts have actually exceeded their customer expectations. And this is important because customer experience impacts revenue. It impacts your effectiveness in being able to truly deliver value to customers, which then of course ultimately impacts the retention, the likelihood of you being able to keep your existing customer business. It also impacts the ease at which customers are able to see value from the experience with your, uh, with your company. So we talk a lot about the customer effort surveys. Um, and of course, that also impacts their likelihood of buying additional products and services. And we all know that it's much easier to sell and market um, your products and solutions to your existing customers. And the return on that market marketing and sales effort is much higher because it takes left e less effort to actually convert those customers. And then lastly is the emotional piece of the customer experience quality, where customers actually feel good about the experience um, and want to then share that experience and refer and recommend your company to others. And then depending on where you are in the world and whether you talk about math or mathematics, maths, um, it actually has a significant financial impact. So a question to the audience is, have you actually run the math or the maths on the impact, for example, of changing your net promoter score from 20 to 23 or increasing your customer satisfaction from 68 to 71 by looking at your current revenue per customer and looking at what the incremental revenue could deliver if you were able to impact these scores. If you haven't, I would highly encourage you to look at quantifying that impact and looking at where in your business you're able to make some of these customer experience improvements across this customer journey. I also really love this Amazon Leadership Principles quote. Um, the Amazon Leadership Principles, there are 12, I think 10 or 12 of them in total, and they have one that is entirely dedicated to customer obsession. And it states that, Leaders start with the customer and work backwards. They work vigorously to earn and keep customer trust. And although leaders pay attention to competitors, they obsess over customers, which really defines how to start thinking about the customer. Again, echoing that Steve Jobs quote, it starts with the customer and it starts with the experience and then works backwards into the technology and the services behind that. And so how do you then focus on customers and knowing and understanding your customer? And it starts with customer personas. So I've included in here an example of what a customer persona looks like. In this example, we're talking about a marketing persona, um, Marketing Mary. This persona example includes an archetype of what the persona would look like. Do they generally tend to skew more male or more female? Um, what kind of age range? What are their demographics like? How much per annum do they earn? And where do they live, um, depending on which country you're located in? What is some of the information around their background? And again, as a reminder, we're looking at this these personas in the aggregate. So looking across things like your Salesforce data or your sales CRM data, um, your existing customer database management, looking through and looking at what kind of job titles do these people have? Do they generally tend to be more male or female? What kind of degrees do they have? Um, and again, looking at appending some of that information and understanding more, a more holistic view about your customer. Looking at and, identif uh, and identifying identifiers um, or documenting identifiers. So in this case, Marketing Mary is very social and she loves to communicate. She interacts with social media. Um, and again, information on how she's interacting with social media. Um, this information can actually be developed by undertaking customer persona interviews, 
um, which is a process I, I recommend if you're able to connect with customers and conduct these interviews either with existing personas or with pers prospective personas or prospective customers that fit, fit that same archetype. What is the persona's goal? In marketing Mary's case, she wants to generify, generate more and better qualified leads for her team, reach 100K of monthly revenue in the next six months, and improve her online marketing uh, return on investment through content marketing. And then again, what are her challenges? Like all of us or a lot of us, she has too much on her plate. She's having to learn online marketing on the job and reporting on the return on investment is difficult across multiple platforms. And this is really, really important information because ultimately what you want to be doing is positioning your product or solution to help your persona achieve their goals or to mitigate the challenges that are on your persona's plate, right? So thinking about and understanding your persona really helps you position your product or your service or your platform solution um, in the eyes of the customer and in the language that the customer would use um, to solve their pain point or to help them attain their goals. Here's another example. It's a banking example. Um, you can see this is Brian. Uh, he's diligently saving. He wants to do everything online. The core elements of the persona, again, you can see this archetypal photo. Um, it te he tends to skew more male in this case. He's based on the East Coast. Um, he's a technical writer and he's he's recently gotten engaged if you read through this little backstory. Again, a snapshot of given this is a banking persona, you know, what does this person have in their checking and savings account? Because you want to understand in aggregate, so you know, across all of the customers on average, how much does this person have to bank with, um, both from a checking and savings and an investment standpoint. Again, you'll see here what are his main goals. What kind of information does he need to make a decision? And what are his main tasks when it comes to banking? He wants to check his account balance. He wants to um, verify his monthly balance through statements and invoices. Um, and he's really trying to um, target his funds or transfer funds from different accounts, right? So again, wanting to do everything online, these are the main tasks. Where and who does he go to for advice? You can see here a lot of his family and his fiance feature really heavily and some friends. And then what kind of devices does he most use? Um, and you can see here there's a combination of both his mobile device as well as, um, as, well as his laptop and which app applications he's more frequently using. I'm also often asked to talk to how many personas an organization should have. Um, certainly, I recommend no more than four core personas um, with ideally one or two main personas. So in this HubSpot example, you can see that there are three core personas, owner Ollie, marketing Mary, and enterprise Erin. And you can see here that owner Ollie is the main persona, sorry, is the secondary persona, um, and therefore marketing Mary and enterprise Erin are both either the main personas or one of these personas is the main persona. And just to go back to the slide, the reason that this is important is the personas actually drive a lot of downstream, both sales and marketing material and initiatives and enablement. And so it's very important to, to keep this really focused so that you can really target your personas and, and do it with a high level of precision because it will, um, when done correctly, significantly improve the return on investment um, on both your sales and marketing um, spend. So when conducting these persona interviews, what kind of information do you want to ask, you know, either your existing clients or your prospective clients that might fit this archetype? Well, where do they find information online? Which conferences do they attend back when people could still go in person? Um, or which online conferences are they attending? Uh, which publications do they read? Who are their thought leaders? How do they spend their week? Who else in the company are their key stakeholders? What defines success in their role? How do they measure success? What is the problem that they're trying to solve? And then how do they think about XYZ solution? And so the goal is then to use this to create this persona um, that then will drive a lot of that sales and marketing effort. And then ultimately, once you have that persona, it's a really important exercise to zoom out and think about how you can create this golden thread with the persona in mind around what you do as an organization, which is your purpose and your promise, 
why you do it, which are your stakeholders and your point of view, and then how you do it, which are your brand experience, your brand personality, and your values. And it's then important to take that brand experience and weave it through all of the different touch points, again, based on those customer um, persona interviews across all of the different stages in your customer journey. So this is a more uh, business to business software as a service example, but how do they know they need your product, right? Where are they looking? Is it some kind of ebook? Do they down download a white paper? Are they checking off a checklist or they download or come across an infographic? How do they evaluate who else is in their consideration set? Um, what kind of information are they using as they go through the acquisition phase? Maybe they're referencing um, a case study or they'd like to talk to an existing customer as a reference. Maybe they're actually looking at the ROI calculator. You know, at the end of the day, do you have uh, a, a, um, an acquisition process which is swiping a credit card and, and signing up online? Or are you sending out a 100-page master services agreement with a 50-page statement of work and, and the lawyers are going backwards and forwards? All of these touch points inform your brand and your customer experience. The next step is then across the engagement phase. How, do they, how does your customer then start to engage with your product? Is there some kind of quick start guide? Is there a self-serve training? Um, or do you need a series of in-person training or webinars? How are you backing that up with marketing material? How are you informing your customers about products? And how are you checking in with them on a regular basis? Or perhaps you've got a physical product and the engagement phase is the actual unboxing of the product and the experience of how the product is, is packaged and how it's delivered. Um, you know, think really about how your customer is starting to engage. How does your customer then tell you about, uh, sorry, then tell others about their experience with your product? Are they, um, can you invite them onto a webinar? Are they willing to be a case study? Will they be a reference? Um, perhaps they're, they're willing to participate in a customer advisory board. And then how are customers making decisions to um, either expand your product portfolio, so buy additional products, or what's happening if a customer churns? Um, what do those touch points look like? And so how do you create this customer-centric content, content? Well, it starts with asking questions to your customers around how do they know that they need your product or service? Um, when it comes to the evalu evaluation stage, how, which companies are in their consideration set? What information do they need to make a decision? How easy is their purchase process? What kind of information do they need to get started? How do customers use your product? How do they see value from your product? And this is a really critical question to answer so that you can ensure that you're delivering that value over and over again throughout the customer journey. Why do your customers love you? How do they express this? Which websites are they going to? Where are they writing reviews? How are they telling others about your company? Which other products do your customers buy and why? And then when customers leave, do you know and understand why they're leaving? So some questions to take away with you um, as you start to think through this process. Who is your target persona? What is their primary need? How does your solution solve that need? And then how do you do this better than others? So what is your unique selling proposition? And with that, we'll move into the next phase of the presentation and we'll start talking about data. So here's an interesting statistic from Forrester, which states, shockingly, um, that only 15% of senior leaders use customer data consistently to inform business decisions. Does anybody know who, how, how this feels and who here is kind of feeling this maybe? Uh, the first is really around data disparity. So this is a lot of data silos all across the organization. The second is views everywhere. So hundreds of views or thousands of different views into the data to make sense of it, which then of course leads to the third fallacy, which is multiple truths. So a lot of people spending more time on validating the data rather than actually taking action based on a single source of truth um, and a single source of insight. Oftentimes I see companies with 
tribal knowledge and hearing people using phrases, things such as, I'm using gut sense, or I feel like I'm flying by, blind, or I, eat, or I eyeball the numbers to make sure that they are correct. Definitely something we want to be avoiding. Also, oftentimes I see heavy BI query logic. So the basic building blocks are not in place with the infrastructure, and dashboards take five to 10 minutes in some cases to run. So again, if you've got a lot of a lot of query logic, um, of course your dashboards are going to take a lot a lot more time to run. Some analysts are trying other avenues to re pre produce reports, and then this of, co of course circles back to the multiple truths, which again the heavy BI query logic also often leads to very resource and and quality insurance intensive, um, where it's often taking several people to produce a weekly uh, a weekly report. And the situation is, is, is very common for companies who have undergone hyper growth um, and who haven't had a chance to get their data house into order. So what does this mean from a data opportunity standpoint? Ultimately, you want to power your business insights value chain to scale your business. So if, I've broken this down into, again, stages of a customer-like journey. Collecting data, ultimately the business need, is to integrate all data sets together to really form a 360 degree, degree view of the customer into some kind of centralized hub, whether that's um, something like Looker or a business visualization tool like Tableau, being able to integrate all of those data sets together um, really helps reduce the multiple data sets um, and the heavy BI query logic. The second phase is analyzing, and ultimately, we want data that is very well described and transparent, so everybody knows what the key terms are and how they're defined. And the solution around this is sitting down and defining data governance and who owns data at your organization, as well as who the key stakeholders are. The third piece is really around decision and action. So ultimately, the business need is around making informed and on-demand decisions, right? Like, we don't want polling data to take a week or to take you know an afternoon or a couple of days and the way to do this is again through data democratization so ensuring that there's a centralized data hub with really good data governance um, ultimately gives you the ability to then democratize the data so that people can actually pull and and review the right information that has been agreed um, as the single source of truth at the corporate level and then lastly, at the end of the day, in order to have impact with your data, you want to ensure that you have innovation and scalability built into this. And this is where you can get really creative and have um, the tech solution around being community driven. So one of the things that we used to do at Hootsuite uh, was ultimately have sharing sessions where certain analysts would come in and on a Friday afternoon they would share their data, their insights and their process with other analysts to be able to talk through and learn from each other, um, which ultimately then feeds back into the innovation and the scalability. We also had task force that would often work through and understand where we could be taking our data uh, um, again to the next level, obviously with our, our data governance team on the information technology side, um, so that we were constantly iterating and, and really thinking about how we could truly innovate and scale on the data front. And so how do you even start this process, right? Like it sounds very complicated uh, and, and obviously that is a lot of a, a large project to undertake. Well, it really starts with thinking about your data across that customer journey and, and starting to think about some of those key data points that you might have at your fingertips in, in one shape or format. Um, things like, are you conducting a customer effort score? and asking your customers how easy it was for them to get started? Are you analyzing your net promoter data, which is telling you how likely uh, the customer is to refer or recommend, so it's a, a lagging indicator of loyalty? There's a ton of information in your support tickets. Can you look through and understand what your top contact drivers are on the customer support side? Are you conducting in-product surveys or something that's in, in the flow of your solution, uh, obviously without being disruptive, but understanding what the customer experience was with the actual product? If customers have the ability to downgrade or cancel um, in a self-serve manner, are you sending a downgrade survey or a cancellation survey that asks them why they're canceling their account with you and collecting that information? 
And then ultimately, if you have a sales CRM, are you collecting that information in um, the closed one or lost notes and analyzing why deals were or are being won or lost? So this is, you know, at a very high level what data in the customer journey looks like. And ultimately, all of this data in aggregate forms the voice of customer. So the first phase in this journey um, is to pick one data source. And ideally, this would be the one data source that has the most return or impact on your business. And then focus on optimizing this area. So for example, maybe you're looking at your closed lost notes to understand why you keep losing a particular type of deal. Is it functionality related? Is it for competitive reasons? Or is there no, uh, no compelling event for your customer to buy your solution. Phase two is to start to look at your data in a more integrated fashion. Maybe the reason you keep losing renewals is that customers have a terrible support experience or that there's a high correlation between your support team and uh, touching a customer in a higher renew renewal rate. Or maybe there's a specific use case which can drive more support volume, which drives more support volume, sorry, which can then be addressed during onboarding. Um, so really correlating two of those data sets together and understanding um, how they interact with each other and what that data is telling you. Phase three is starting to move towards a unified customer profile. And this is where we're really starting to understand information about your customers across each touch point of their interaction with you. And this is where we start to need to integrate systems in the back end to be able to pull a lot of this data together. So, you know, does your customer click on a site? Um, is the deal closed one? What happens from a CRM perspective? Uh, are they opening the emails? Are they clicking through on the emails that you're sending them? Um, what are they doing in your product? Uh, what does your customer support data tell you about them, et cetera, et cetera. And then lastly, phase four is using this unified customer profile to start to be predictive and proactive in your outreach with customers. So if a certain customer undertakes something on your site, do you automatically send them a triggered um, email message? If you know that 80% of your customers who come onto your website who take actions A followed by B followed by C, then go on and take action D, if a customer comes onto your site, and, and completes action A, B, and C, can you then automatically serve them up option D, knowing that that's their next most likely scenario? Similarly, are your um, NPS scores driving a customer success manager outreach, both on the very positive and very negative side, and what does that look like? Can you use your product data to guide customers into a specific workflow that you know then leads to a higher propensity to um, either renew or upsell? And then of course the next step is really starting to use your customer data as a competitive advantage. The Netflix recommendation engine has been valued at $1 billion. This is not the company, this is the algorithm that drives the recommendations. It is such a core part of their offering, they even put verbiage to that effect on their site. Netflix are so good at knowing what you want to watch, they've started making their own shows with $8 billion invested in content in 2018 and that number is ever growing. They are now a serious Hollywood contender taking on the likes of Universal Studios and Disney. And this is mind blowing when you think about the fact that Netflix was a company that started shipping mail order DVDs. So if you want to understand the power of your data, think about harnessing your customer data in the way that Netflix did and really bringing that into your competitive advantage. Amazon is another great example. You know, Amazon knows I recently received an Echo Dot that I often buy hair product related products online and a whole host of information about me. So in fact, Honestly, Amazon knows so much about me that I, I often turn to them as, as a, a, a single source of finding my standard consumer products because they exactly know what it is I need and when I need it. So the key questions around data to take from this are, how do you build an automation to enhance your product in a way that improves the user experience? How can you use data to build products that serve the customer from day one? 
Are you able to run A, B tests with and without the data? And then can you look at buying data samples to augment the data that you already have um, and really build on top of, um, of that to really take your data management and targeting your personas to the next level? And that is a topic for a whole separate presentation. And of course, in order to do that, as we mentioned, it really involves starting to think about your customer journey. Um, here's a standard customer journey where the customer starts on the website, downloads a case study, um, receives a nurture fit email, maybe starts a free trial, completes an NPS survey, submits a support ticket and converts to a, play, a paid um, plan. So a very simple self-service customer journey. But of course, all of the tools and technology behind this could be a very, very complicated web in terms of starting to think about bringing these together when you think about all of the different source systems that house this information. So really important to think about this from the outset and to start to get your data um, house in order in the back end to really be um, starting to build a proactive and predictive customer experiences. And of course, here is a, a 2018 Experian report around data management maturity. So maybe just take a, a, a minute to think about where you might be on this data management maturity curve. Um, do you have an understanding and have you started to quantify the impact of your data? Um, have you started looking at the quality of your data? And what is the level of trust in your data as a strategic asset? Do you have any ded dedicated or designated data specific roles in your organization? And, um, and where is your data housed? This is coming back to that siloed data management. Um, are you starting to be more, more proactive in your management? Do you have sponsors of data charters and success metrics? Uh, is there clear ownership of the data between the business and IT? And are you actually starting to focus on root cause analysis rather than just solving some of these surface issues with all of the data silos? Um, are you starting to bring that together? And then, of course, um, you know, at the optimized end of the scale, do you have a role like a chief data officer or some kind of very senior and strategic data governance role in place? And is this person accountable for corporate-wide data assets? Is data quality managed as a part of standard operations? And then do you have a platform-based approach to profiling, monitoring, and visualizing data? And then, of course, lastly, do you trust your data? Um, shockingly, only of, of this KPMG Guardians of Trust report conducted in 2018, um, of the senior executives surveyed, only 35% had a high level of trust in the way the organization uses data. Um, just under two-thirds said that the technology functions bear responsibility when some kind of machine learning or algorithm goes wrong, and a whopping 92% are concerned about the negative impact of data on the organize, organization's reputation. So really, really important to understand um, and, and ensure that you start thinking about data from the outset, um, or at least make sure that you're on your data journey um, so that you can start to bring these together uh, for the long term. So again, some practical um, takeaway questions just to ponder. Where are you in your data journey? And what is one thing that you are going to do now? Okay, so with the data behind us, we're now going to shift gears and talk about customer support. And I wanted to reflect on my time at Hootsuite and use some of the customer support infrastructure that we set up there to take you through how I recommend um, thinking about your customer support organization. So just by way of background, um, customer support at Hootsuite had 24-7 coverage in six languages. We had five shifts in four different locations. We operated seven channels of support and had around 25,000 interactions monthly. Our customer support mission was that we are passionate advocates for our customers and each other, which is really important. By listening and learning, we provided one-of-a-kind experiences while having fun along the way. And because we were a social media company, we like to hashtag that with the hashtag ThinkLikeSherlock. 
And this, by the way, really encouraged our advocates to think two or three steps ahead of what a customer was asking. So rather than having multiple back and forth with the customer, if they asked for a piece of information which a customer support rep would understand that was incomplete, they would send them the complete set of interactions or the complete set of instructions rather than waiting for a number of back and forth interactions. So ultimately, what are your customer support objectives? Well, the first is to provide high quality, fast service to customers that drives retention and loyalty. The second is to optimize efficiency and cost and to grow revenue at a global scale. So you want to be um, growing, sorry, you want to be growing revenue much faster than you are growing cost, right? So there needs to be a non-linear relationship, which means you ultimately need to drive efficiency to ensure that your cost is not growing at the same rate as your revenue from a customer support standpoint. And then at the end of the day, you really want to train, empower, promote, and recognize your team. So how should you think about your customer support workforce model? It starts with something like monthly active users um, or orders if you're more of an e-commerce model. What is the historical contact rate by channel? So looking at all of the different channel contacts across the different channels that you're operating, timesing that by what your advocate productivity and efficiency is by each of those channels, which ultimately gives you the number of advocates you need to support your business based on the incoming volume. You can then look at your contact arrival patterns. So what time of day uh, are a lot of your calls or a lot of your emails coming in to your contact center? And then what kind of language coverage do you need on those different um, contact arrival patterns? So if you've got a European business and you need language coverage in German, you know, eight o'clock in the morning uh, in Europe is six o'clock, I think, in the evening or vice versa. Um, in North America, so do you need to have people situated um, or employed in Europe and similarly across APAC, Latin America and North America and then how can you think of some of the other language coverage that you potentially may need um, such as, as Spanish, maybe French if you're in, in Canada um, and how can you potentially leverage some of your existing team to help with that coverage by playing with some of the um, some of the hours that those that those team members are working. Of course, it's really important to understand which contact channels you want to support in your business. Do you have a free or a freemium type of business? Is there a self-serve business where customers are, are helping themselves and, and really setting themselves up through that process? And then do you potentially have an enterprise business? And not all contact channels are created the same. So as you can see here in blue, things like frequently asked questions, any kind of support forum or any kind of automation around chat has the ability to deflect tickets away from having a live person answering those questions. Anything in the light green here has the ability um, to be a delayed response channel. So something like a contact us form or a, um, or a ticket ultimately does not necessarily have to be responded to immediately and therefore gives you a little bit of additional time to be able to respond to that client. The live channels, which are things like Twitter, Facebook, uh, sorry, Twitter, Facebook, live chat and phone, they all require a relatively real time interaction. And so there is a much higher level of resourcing that's required because somebody needs to be sitting there ready to take the phone call, the live chat, um, or the social media interaction and make sure that it's answered in the appropriate time frame. So as you're thinking about this and building out some of your customer contracts and your service level agreements, thinking about how be thinking about how you may be able to differentiate your service level agreements based on the type of customer. So in this case, we're, we've got a self-serve business, an enterprise business, and maybe a premium enterprise business. And what does that look like? A chatbot is obviously in real time. How quickly are you going to commit to customers that you're going to respond to them across all of the different channels um, in which you want to interact? And then, of course, there's an evolution of your customer support. So most companies start with a follow the sun model 
and, and really look at some of the more delayed channels like email, um, where there's a one business day or two business day time frame, and then managing that through small distributed teams. And they may have lo a low volume of social media that when the customer team is not answering email, they're, they're tackling social media inquiries. That often evolves over a one or two or a number of years into adding channels such as chat and phone, which of course need to be answered in more real time and therefore require additional staffing in many cases. And in some cases, looking at expanding out globally through regionalization, so coverage in, a, in um, excuse me, Asia Pacific and EMEA, Latin America, and then ultimately moving, and, and sorry, in some cases, a partner network, and then ultimately moving into, as we discussed before with uh, the data, predictive and proactive models. So thinking about and knowing and understanding your customer's behavior um, so that you can predictively pop up the solution that they're looking for, ideally um, preempting the need to have to contact a human and solving the problem before the customer actually needs to reach out. And again, a lot of this is driven through artificial intelligence and making sure that that back end is, is really in order from a data governance perspective and really only truly makes sense once there's enough data to be able to derive this insight and get to a true level of scale. So takeaway questions on the support side are to think about what is your customer support volume? How do you want your customers to contact you? Have you defined your service level agreements? Where in the world are your customers located? And in which languages do you need coverage? So with that, we'll switch gears and we're coming into the home stretch. And with, I'm going to talk about social customer engagement, which is the last topic we have to cover today. So I like to use this five-step social customer engagement framework that we used at Hootsuite. The first is to really identify what your customers need and what they're really looking for when it comes to social customer support. And we'll go through each one of these in more detail. The second is to integrate social into your existing customer service infrastructure by deploying some kind of social media management solution across your team and organization. The third step is then to educate your team on how to engage on social for success. We'll talk more about that. The next step is to unify your social strategy across the organization. And then lastly, you really want to try and delight your customer and proactively be a part of the larger conversation that they're having. So the first step, as we talked about, is to identify, audit, and understand where your customers are looking for help on social customer support. Audit your organization's social media footprint and ask, your, ask yourself or your organization how many current social media accounts are being used and who in the organization is monitoring them. Do you have a separate social media account that is being managed by marketing and one that is being managed by support, for example, and how do these two organizations talk to each other? It's also really important to understand if there are any fraudulent or unauthorized accounts that might be uh, harming or distracting your audience or provi providing false information. So I highly recommend conducting an audit of your social media presence really to see what is out there in terms of your organization's social media footprint. And there's a data statistic here from Altimeter, which states that the average enterprise has 178 social media profiles. Step two is to integrate social media into your existing customer service structure. And here I recommend deploying a social relationship platform or some kind of social media management solution. Of course, I'm heavily biased and would highly recommend Hootsuite for this. Ultimately, you want to determine on which social networks you want to engage for support. If you are just starting out, I highly recommend that you start with one social network where you can commit to providing excellent customer service. And again, this goes back to earlier, the conversation we had about really understanding your customer and doing the work around the personas. By understanding which social networks 
on which social networks your customers are most active, you can actually then focus your customer engagement framework or your social customer engagement framework so you can, can actually commit to providing excellent service on maybe those one or two social networks in which most of your customers are engaging and then slowly build out your strategy for, from there. For example, there's not a lot of point on having amazing customer service on Twitter, for example, if most of your customer support or most of your customers are actually engaging with your company on Facebook. And you, what you're finding is a lot of, a lot of customers are, are replying to things like your company posts asking um, customer support questions. So that would be an indication that you maybe need to redirect your efforts and, and do some of the work around personas and where they really want, where your customer really wants to engage with you. I also recommend determining whether to use a company handle or create a dedicated help handle or page. Um, again here, I also recommend creating a separate customer support or help handle um, as a dedicated handle or page and encouraging your, your followers uh, um, or your customers to this help handle or page will make it easier for you to scale as you grow your social customer support um, presence. So what it also does is it takes any kind of negative commentary off of your main um, company page and brings it into a dedicated page which your customer support team can then monitor and make sure that your customers get a, a fast response and get answers to their questions. Again, uh, a, a statistic by NM Insight here, 30% of customers would rather receive customer su support or service on social media than contact a company by phone. The third step is really to engage, uh, sorry, to educate your team to engage on social media for success. And a part of this is by providing platform training for widespread adoption and usage. So if you're ultimately launching some kind of social media management solution or some kind of social relationship platform, it's really, really important to provide training to make sure that as many people as possible can adopt and use the platform to prevent any kind of miscommunication between teams in terms of who is answering which question and what the service level is for answering that type of question. It's also important to create social media policies and guidelines so that everybody is very clear on what is and isn't appropriate from a company standpoint in terms of engaging with customers on social media. And then I also recommend providing a framework for a consistent tone of voice. And this is a little bit of art and a little bit of science. So whilst you wanna provide a framework for a consistent tone and train all of your employees who are engaging with social media on your company's um, brand voice to ensure that they're answering in that brand voice, you do at the same time want to avoid using scripts that make your agents sound very robotic because at the end of the day, social media is a very dynamic, it's supposed to be a real-time platform. And so you do want to ensure that your customer support agents still have um, the right tone of voice for your brand, um, but it's des designed to be in real time and engage with your customers in a very natural flow. So try and avoid using scripts that make it sound um, very kind of programmatic and robotic. Again, another statistic here um, from Ultimata that only 18% of organizations state that their employees are aware of their social media policies and procedures. On to step four. Your next step is to then unify your social strategy across the organization. Some data here from Ultimata again. On average, um, through the work we did at Hootsuite working with Ultimata, we knew that on average there were up to 13 different departments using social media across an organization. And when that happens, not all of those departments are talking to each other and communicating with each other, especially if you don't have a social relationship platform or a social media management solution. And that often, um, that often results in a, a large number, as you can see here, of companies that are actually just genuinely not responding to tweets or to social media posts. Or the flip side is uh, where marketing and customer support roles are starting to converge on social media, finding that the roles are overlapping and, and having two people reach out to the same customer with potentially different information because they have different contexts. So it's very important to have a unified social strategy across your organization 
and establish a workflow of who responds to what. And then again, if you are using a social relationship platform or a social media management solution, how will you assign messages to other teams in your organization? And what is the time frame in which you expect them to respond to the customer so that everybody's on the same page in terms of who's responding to what and how quickly? And again, um, you know, ultimately customer service roles and responsibilities are to reduce resolution times, um, to provide customer assistance at, at a lower cost, um, and to improve the customer or the buyer journey. Whereas marketing is generally more responsible for improving brand sentiment, um, managing reputation and any kind of brand crisis, um, and also engaging with those loyal brand enthusiasts and, and advocates. And then lastly, step five, um, and this is where it can start to get quite fun, is really start to delight the customer and proactively step in and be a part of the larger conversation. Um, so again, some interesting and important data here. One third of negative reviews are actually deleted or updated to be positive uh, based on an interaction with the customer. And over half of unhappy customers are more willing to stay with the current company if that company attempted to reach out and solve their problem. So it's really important to use a social relationship platform with comprehensive listening and monitoring capabilities to identify customer comments that might not be directed to official accounts. Again, are you listening? Are you um, updating your search strings to listen for words like can't, don't, won't, you know, sucks, um, different misspellings maybe of your company's names if, if letters are inverted. Um, so really to pick up these types of spellings, particularly on, on social networks such as Twitter, and to reach out and really proactively resolve these nascent issues before they escalate into potentially a full-blown crisis. So proactive messaging is, is really key, and here are some examples of what we used to do at Hootsuite. One is using customer data and polls to anticipate some of your common customer issues and provide tips based on results. Um, so here you can look at videos, GIFs, visuals, help desk articles. Here's a poll. Um, each week we share tips about a specific topic. Which part of Hootsuite would you like to see more tips about, right? Um, and this is an, an example of a, a short video clip that shows how to use a new piece of functionality that was recently released um, to really train customers and show them how to use um, that information. Again, to help prevent customers having to all come inbound into the customer support organization um, to ask that question to then proactively go out and give that information to customers. I also recommend building trust with your users by sharing live updates. Again, um, as you can see at Hootsuite, we had a separate help handle for Twitter. And again, you can see here, you know, we're seeing uh, our dev team is investigating an intermittent API error in, um, in the Twitter streams. Please check the blog for status updates. And then here you can also see a live update. Um, we're seeing improvements with the API. Um, and again, customers really allow this really allows your customers or followers to find answers to their questions before they ask them, which is a really great way to drive customer engagement and keep your customers really, really happy. The next thing I recommend is letting people know that you're there. Again, you can customize this through seasonality, happy Valentine's Day, happy Friday, um, you know, with, with a lot of gifts. And also show off your culture and humanize the channel. Um, here are an example of my amazing customer advocate team at Hootsuite uh, and really showcasing the team and, and kind of humanizing the channel. Uh, and you can see that come through in a lot of, um, in a lot of, the, uh, in the, a lot of the proactive tweets as well. And, and that brings me to our next point, interacting with other brands and celebrating occasions and ultimately having fun with users or customers who reach out to you. Um, so again, welcoming Apple to Apple's to, to back to Twitter, Apple support, um, celebrating International Women's Day, um, you know, really uh, representing pink shirts to show Pink Shirt Day or to show our support for Pink Shirt Day um, and to prevent and minimize cyberbullying. Um, and then I love this one up here, Hootsuite help, what should I have for lunch? Um, and then the, you know, ultimately the customer support advocate, advocate replied with a, a whole lot of the, um, the lunch food emojis. 
Ultimately, you really want to make sure it's very easy for your customers to contact you on social media. Um, so providing easy to find customer support options in your navigation. Um, again, you can we linked at Hootsuite to our uh, to our dashboard uh, and gave our customers the ability to tweet to us very easily, um, as well as contact us via Facebook if they had any issues. And again, on our contact us support page, um, we also offered options to be able to reach out to us on social media. And then lastly, adding uh, call to actions on blog posts and, um, and on self-promotional tweets. So, you know, here's a tweet that basically talks about the fact that our customer support team is available 24-7. Please reach out to Hootsuite Help for any questions. And again, um, a Facebook post, sorry, a Twitter post here, um, tweet us for Hootsuite support straight from your dashboard. We're online 24-7. So I know we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I wanted to just end with a quick summary. Today we've covered a number of topics. The first is really around knowing your customer and customer personas, understanding and defining your customer experience, developing your data roadmap, determining your customer support strategy, and listening to customer feedback. So the call to action I would like to invite you to participate in is to take a moment to write down, based on the presentation, what are your top three priorities? What is your timeline? What is one thing you can do this week? Who will hold you accountable? And who else needs to be involved? My name is Kirsty Trail, and it's been my pleasure to talk with you today. Thank you very much.